But here we are in the theme of the book of Acts. And this is worth just remembering what Acts is about. It's the acts of Jesus through his apostles by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the reason we keep coming back to that title is not just to remind us that we've got a heading for this series and I've thought about it, um, but it's because right at the beginning of Acts, Luke says that um, he's writing down all that uh, he had written down in his, in his gospel, all that Jesus began to do and teach. And so by implication, Acts is what Jesus continued to do and also therefore what G Jesus continues to do today. Um, so uh, that's, that's why we're working through. And we need to see that the, those who were witnessing for Jesus aren't the stars of the event. It's Jesus who is the star again and again. They're pointing to him. And the only way they're able to do that is by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we were seeing as we started this morning. Now, the next slide um, is the theme for, uh, for this Sunday, for Acts chapter 12. Um, the word of God is unstoppable through suffering. Um, and one of the things we see in Acts is that of the 28 chapters of Acts, I think it's 26 of them, have the theme of suffering and persecution in them. And so as the word of God goes out, um, we, are, uh, we see how um, suffering goes with that. And that doesn't take God's people by surprise. In fact, Jesus said to expect it. And so we come to Acts chapter 12, and let's dive into the passage. It's there on your screen. You can read it along with me. Acts chapter 12. It was about this time that King Herod, so we've just heard about um, the church thriving in Antioch in a Gentile region, getting ready to be this amazing mission center um, that will launch the gospel to the ends of the earth, um, led particularly by uh, Saul, who became Paul. Um, and we'll see that in Acts 13. But Acts 12 closes out with this, and it zooms back into Jerusalem. It was about that time, as the gospel was thriving across the world, that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. So that's the first of the 12 apostles um, who are killed. We've seen Stephen, one of the, uh, one of the seven, was killed back in uh, Acts chapter eight. But here's uh, one of the, the, the first apostle to be killed, James, the brother of John. When Herod saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. That's also known as the Passover. So after arresting him, Herod put Peter in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the We're gonna see lots of little details in here which show that this is a historical account. And we need to know that because some of the stuff that happens here is quite extraordinary. Um, and yet the kind of detail that Luke put in here, like the, the four squads of four soldiers each, that was a standard practice for guarding high profile prisoners. And Luke just would not have known that unless he was getting his information from eyewitnesses. Um, so here we are. Um, at the same time that Jesus was uh, put in prison and handed over to be killed, Peter is put in prison. And the church knows what's going to happen, that Herod got so much um, popularity by killing James that here the strong finds another way to suppress the weak and puts Peter in prison as well, trying to get more credit from the, particularly the Jewish opposition um, to the gospel advance. And this doesn't take the church by surprise because Jesus had said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And, and this is normal, especially when the church is growing. Um, so as we, we see the church grow in Acts, so persecution grows. And actually that's true across the world. So the two countries where the gospel is growing the fastest in terms of the number of people coming to the Lord are Iran and Afghanistan. As far as I know from, from what I've heard, uh, and you can read this through different um, organizations that look out for persecuted Christians, 
the, the two fastest growing churches are two of the most persecuted in Iran and Afghanistan. And it's the theme across, um, on the whole, most nations where the gospel is growing fast also see great persecution increase. And so as we, as we think for ourselves, do we want the gospel to grow and flourish in this country? Do we want the lost to be saved? Do we want many people to come to know Jesus as we go out with the good and kind and gracious message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus who died for us? If we want that, we must expect that persecution will increase also. We must be willing to put our lives and our reputations on the line for the sake of sharing the gospel. Jesus told us to expect it. In fact, um, he said this amazing thing, which would have been a great comfort to the believers as they saw James and others killed. Um, Peter, uh, Jesus said this in uh, Matthew chapter 10. He said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet... Not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Jesus is saying, your, your heavenly father never, never says, oops, uh, I didn't mean that to happen. Oh, that was a mistake with James, but let's see if we can fix that with Peter. Um, no, our heavenly father knows exactly what's going to happen. And he won't let anyone die or be persecuted or suffer outside of his care. And so although we might ask the question, why was James killed? And as we're going to see, Peter was saved. Actually, both were under the precious care of our Heavenly Father. And the church knew that. And they knew where the power really lies. And so, of course, they gathered to pray. Yeah, we see it as we continue in Acts chapter 12, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Herod looked so strong. Peter looked so weak. And all the church can do is pray. Well, this is quite some small group gathering in houses to pray. Do we think like this when we're praying? Do we long for the gospel to advance and for us to have boldness, even whatever the opposition we might face? Well, let's see what happens as the church prays. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick! Get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put your clothes, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak round you and follow me, the angel told him. Now, just in case we think Peter is some kind of SAS hero doing jailbreak, he doesn't even remember to put on his clothes and sandals. And he needs to be reminded to put his cloak on and then to follow the angel. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they'd walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Now this seems utterly extraordinary, and it is. It is. It's rare, even in the Bible, for something like this to happen. And we might think that this kind of thing could never happen again. But actually, I read a biography a number of years ago um, called Heavenly Man about um, a Chinese pastor who um, went around sharing the gospel in a similar way to how Peter did. And um, under immense persecution there, he ended up in prison several times. And there was one evening where the church were praying for him. And um, he had a very similar incident when you, when you read it. And I recommend it. It's just if you're looking for some summer reading, read Heavenly Man 
Um, it's just very exciting about how the gospel spreads through China, um, focusing on this one man in particular. But um, the Lord is still able to do things like that. They're very rare. We shouldn't expect it um, necessarily in our lives. But we know that the Lord is in control and he really does care for his people. It's reassuring that we might not expect it um, because actually the church we see praying didn't expect it. As we, as we go on here, just have a look at the eyewitnesses, eyewitness details. And um, there's a bit of humor in it, which I imagine they enjoyed retelling as they told the story um, again and again. When this had dawned on him, that's Peter, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So we get very specific name details here. Then Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognised Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. <laughs> so she opens the door, she obviously slams it back in his face. She runs back and says, Peter's at the door. And the church are obviously not expecting their prayers to be answered because they say, you are out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, oh, the more rational explanation is that it must be his angel or, or a spirit of some kind or a messenger. Um, but Peter kept on knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Obviously so astonished, they started crying out loud. And Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this. And then he left for another place. They are not expecting their prayers to be answered in an extraordinary, miraculous way like this. And so we can't say to each other, if only we had more faith to believe the impossible, then we would see it happen. No, if only we prayed more, we would see God do things that we don't expect. And it's really striking, isn't it? That they're so not expecting it, that it's harder for Peter to get into a church prayer meeting than it is for him to get out of jail. <laughs> That's something worth reflecting on. Anyway, um, we also see here that Peter is not complacent. Um, he doesn't presume that because the Lord has been gracious to him with one miraculous escape, that therefore everything's going to be easy from now on. Um, he tells them to let James, that's um, not the James who was killed, that's James, the brother of Jesus, who became the most prominent church leader in Jerusalem uh, from this time on. He tells them to tell James um, and the others, and then he goes for, to another place. He obviously um, knows he needs to get away and that the guards will be coming looking for him soon enough. And of course they'd come looking for him and trying to find him because as we continue in the passage, verse 18, in the morning, there was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. This is a bit of a, a somber and sad ending to this particular episode. Um, Herod obviously doesn't believe the story of the miracle. He assumes that it's an inside job and soldiers who were paid to guard a prisoner, if they failed in their duties, um, then they themselves would suffer the fate, same fate as the prisoner they were supposed to be guarding. And so they were killed because they'd failed to look after Peter. And we simply don't know what conversations Peter might have had with them, how he might have been able to share the gospel with them, how they would have known that this was a miracle and whether or not they had trusted in Christ. Um, that's between them and the Lord. But we get to see a little bit more about Herod, this cruel man. And it's worth saying that this Herod um, is not the Herod that we meet at the beginning of the Gospels or even in the middle of the Gospels. Um, so there was uh, Herod the Great, who was the one who tried to kill all the other babies, uh, baby boys at the time of Jesus' birth. And then his son, who we meet in the Gospels. And then this is his grandson. Herod Agrippa the first. Um, I think there are at least five Herods um, and, um, and this is one of them but they all seem to hold this sort of cruel ruthless power grabbing sense um, and this, this Herod was particularly successful and we get to see that in the next passage.
as we come to, to the end. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He'd been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, what a great name, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. Uh, this is uh, bang on, historically accurate. Um, it's exactly uh, what would have happened. Um, in fact, we know that this particular gathering happens because it's recorded by the historian Josephus, who was a Jewish uh, historian and a um, a supporter and sympathizer with Herod and quite impressed by the way that he had increased his territory um, and he had control over the food supply of these people from Tyre and Sidon and so they're coming to him sort of desperate to please him and impress him um, and he knows that and so verse 21 on the appointed day Herod wearing his royal robes sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people we're told in Josephus's account of this um, that those royal robes that he wore were actually made of silver and so that they shone in the sun. Um, and so he wanted to look like um, a sort of divine authority presence among them as the sun rose on him in the great stadium in Caesarea. And so they shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. And immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. Well, again, that may sound um, extraordinary, but actually Josephus's account, even though he was sympathetic with Herod as king of the Jews, um, records this as happening, that um, Herod suddenly was struck ill while he was addressing the people. Um, and he told the people that he thought he was dying and then uh, within five days, he was dead. Um, and it seems to be that he had some horrific disease of um, internal rot. And so even as he died, uh, worms might have spilled out of his body. And so as extraordinary and weird as this sounds, um, it's an account that is historically accurate. Um, and as we, as we think on this theme of the word of God being unstoppable, through suffering, we can see that even the most terrifying rulers cannot restrict the spread of the gospel. Do you see that last sentence there in the passage? But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Now, I don't know exactly why um, we're looking at this right now, and just knowing the whole uh, stretch of God's word um, is hugely helpful. Um, but it was really encouraging hearing Krista saying that we, as a church, put more and more emphasis on um, trying to share our faith publicly. And I think as we do that, in our own 21st century way, um, we will experience persecution. We will experience friends and family thinking that we're weird and strange and being fed up with us for going on and on about Jesus. Um, we'll experience the fact um, that we seem isolated and on our own. Um, I've been struggling the last few weeks, just because um, Henry has been repeatedly saying that um, he doesn't want to trust in Jesus because none of his friends do. And um, that's immensely demoralizing. And I um, value your, we'd value your um, prayers for him as a little six year old. He just feels that he is different to all of his friends. Um, and we're going to feel that more and more as we put our heads above the parapet and say how amazing Jesus is. Um, Henry had been our, one of our greatest evangelists among his school friends and trying to share it with them. And he's just feeling that pressure. Um, and in different ways, we will, we will feel it too. And, um, and so the question is, what will, we, um, what will we do as the word of God starts to spread and flourish and we experience this persecution? Well, we need to be, we need to be ready. We need to be ready. And, I don't know if it struck you and we can think about this as we, we open it up um, as I draw to a close, but there were a few verses in Psalm, Psalm 37 um, that Ashley sang for us um, that say this. Verse 32, the wicked watches for the righteous and seeks to put him to death. The Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he's brought to trial. Wait for the Lord 
and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. I have seen a wicked, ruthless man, spreading himself like a green laurel tree, but he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. The word of God is unstoppable through suffering. And that suffering may be persecution, it may be um, individual, but it's worth thinking through for yourself. How will you deal with suffering as it comes? Um, but it was so striking, wasn't it, how even the greatest opponent, uh, Herod, in this episode, um, just met with the end that Psalm 37 said would happen to those who set themselves up against God. And actually, all of us can have that hard attitude that Herod had of, um, I don't want God to be in charge of my life. I want to be in charge of my life for myself. And, um, and so we need to think through um, how we could have that attitude of just wanting to, to, to rule our life our way, like Herod did, um, and set ourselves up against God in our own lives. And maybe just the, the aging process in our lives. And we can say this to, to those around us who are trying to share the good news of Jesus. Doesn't, doesn't the very fact that you're getting older and, and that we're focusing on, on the death toll in this um, uh, coronavirus period, doesn't that remind you that we are mortal and that one day we will meet our end? And that whether it's in a dramatic way like Herod or just in a very normal way, we will come face to face with the living God as our judge. And don't you want to meet him with good news, the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died so that you could be forgiven, who lived that perfect life that you have never lived? Don't you, don't you want that? Don't you long for that? And don't you long for meaning and purpose now in this life, rather than just working your way through it and ruling your life your way and just being your own kind of mini Herod, God of your own life? Yes, you might feel like you're in control, but you're not in control. Don't you want the true God of the universe to be in control of your life and to rule your life and to give you good news to live for? Now, as we challenge people in that way, initially they won't like it, but actually some will turn and believe. And so it's worth putting our necks on the line. It's worth being willing to suffer so that others can know the good news of the Lord Jesus. Let's pray and then I'll hand back to Ashley. Father, thank you for these amazing examples in your word. We thank you for this amazing church that knew the suffering to expect and turned to you and sought you and gathered in homes to plead with you, to pray earnestly, not knowing what you might do, but knowing that you're the one who's in control, who can answer our prayers. We pray that you, we as a church would more earnestly step into this prayerful attitude as we seek to share the gospel with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.